Welcome to the Materials, Basics, Shaders, and Materials lecture for Maya. We are going to learn how to assign shading materials to objects, edit the color, assign a shading material with specific color and surface attributes, and differentiate between shading material types such as Lambert, Blinn, and Fong to achieve a specific appearance. Real-world materials are viewed based on what they're made of, um, their surface characteristics, and the light that they're reflecting, uh, and therefore the environment around them. In Maya, you provide your surfaces and objects with these characteristics by shading them. In Maya, you need to do something to create this appearance. Maya uh, assigns, creates and assigns shaders to a surface to make this appear in that way. Maya comes with a number of surfaces, some of which you may not see because they can be plugins sometimes. Um, if you can't find them, uh, contact me if you need them, but most of the basic ones that we use that we use should be there by default. Um, some effects can only pre be produced by specific renderers and we're going to be talking about rendering engines in this unit as well. Um, a material or a material node more precisely in Maya is the part of the shader that controls the color and shininess and the surface attributes um, generally speaking how the material reacts to light. There are several material types that deal with shininess, and they deal with it differently. Um, shininess is generally the first attribute you need to determine. Specular is a kind of reflection or highlight that occurs on the surface of smooth or shiny objects. High specular levels are generally used on glass spheres, chrome, and stuff like that. How this highlight is reflected tells us whether the surface is dull, smooth, shiny, or metallic. Generally, the highlight assumes the color of the light, depending on the material. Uh, with metals, the highlight is going to be a tint of the metallic surface. And glossiness occurs when there is some degree of specularity. This attribute determines how spread out the highlight is. So something like wet surfaces. So for this first little bit here, I'm going to create a few parts, um, a few spheres that I can just kind of play with. So, and in fact, they don't even have to be spheres if you don't want them to. And just duplicate them to create a little grid of six. Doesn't matter if they're perfect. But um, if we go through some of the different shading types here, um, it comes already shaded with Lambert. So Lambert is the matte material has no shininess. It's something that you would use for a porous surface or chalk, matte paint, or unpolished surfaces. The default material that gets assigned to new objects when you create them is called Lambert 1. And to reiterate, you don't want to change any of the attributes on this particular surface. Instead, you would assign a new material by right-clicking on the object and selecting Assign New Material, then go to Lambert, and we'll get a new Lambert material that we can play with. So I'll call that Chalk, and we can make that a very pale blue color. Anisotropic represents a material that has surfaces with grooves. 
like CDs, feathers, or fabrics. The specular shading attributes or shiny highlights determine the direction of the grooves as well as their properties. So let's select another sphere, right click and assign new material. And we're going to go to anisotropic, which appears to not be there. So let's see what we've got highlighted over here. I've got it on favorites. So I'm going to go down to all the Maya surfaces and highlight that instead. And I see now I've got anisotropic. And we'll give it a lovely color. Maybe. Come on, take take the color. Okay, well, all right, well, did that. I was going for kind of a fuchsia. I don't know why I was being so picky about taking that color, but whatever. Okay, and this is anisotropic, so it's got a particular um, highlight on it that has this interesting little wave and you can move that around with the angle attribute down here and you can see where it where it's changing let me take that selection off now let's go into windows rendering editors Hypershade. Okay, so the angle has this sort of effect on it that I don't know why it's giving me such a small range either. Type in 360. There we go you can see how the specular highlight kind of spins around with the angle. Spread X and Y, um, if you reduce that value it spreads out further and if you increase it it gets more and more pronounced. So somebody with some very gelled hair might have a higher value there. Roughness is kind of like how big the, or how how spread out I should say the highlight is so you can see if I turn it way down I've got these turns into like almost a reflective glass I can turn it up a little bit starts getting blurrier and blurrier this becomes more apparent with this wacky little object that they have in the hypershade material because the hypershade window where you're editing the materials because the the surface changes on this object are kind of highlighting the changes in the material so as you can see And we can change which shader this is using when we look at it between Hardware and Arnold. And Arnold is not something we use in this class officially, but it is something you're welcome to play with. It's a um, realistic, photorealistic photon mapper. So it's going to, um, instead of following the light rays, it's going to actually um, create photon particles that bounce around the scene. Um, I'm just going to stick with hardware and you can change the object as well between shader ball, cloth, teapot, I thought I chose cloth there, there we go, cloth, ocean splash. So these all give you a feel for the the material that you're creating. 
hair would probably be a good one for this particular object since um, that's what anisotropic is made for. So you got get a feel that this is this is a good shader for objects with grooves in it and stuff so anyway um, that's anisotropic I'm gonna close that window actually I probably could have left it open but whatever Fong and Fong E we've talked about a little bit um, let's select the next object and assign new material and this gets if this is a little too big and overwhelming you can always go back to favorites we'll go to Fong here and then I'm going to assign Fong E to this one and those again uh, to reiterate are, are essentially the same thing Fong E renders a little faster um, but uh, it's a little more bare bones too so Fong and Fong E do a really good job with things like plastic and ceramic. Um, Fong is a material that represents glassy or glossy surfaces. Um, things like car, phone, car moldings, telephones, and bathroom fixtures with a hard specular highlight. Um, these are, let's make this white color here. These are really good for, let's say, a piece of ceramic. And I am going to the cosine, if I bring that up, that's kind of the same thing as the specular highlight. So, and, and um, let me just step back and just kind of stress a little bit. Don't worry about numeric values or what exactly these things mean. Um, you know, it's if you understand what the tabs mean, that's mostly what's important. And then you can just kind of tweak the settings to get the look that you want. So, specular color, that's the color of the highlight. Um, I don't have anything really formulaic to say about these settings other than just tweak them until you get the look that you want. Reflectivity is the amount of reflection that will appear in the object, but this will not show up until we turn it on in the renderer, which I'm going to talk about later. So it won't actually reflect anything, no matter what the setting is, until that's turned on in the renderer. Um, so let's go to, and I should be naming these, let's call this Fong1, let's call this Cue Ball. Not Cure Ball. And anisotropic one, I'm going to call that um, hair. And I think I called that chalk. Okay, good. And we'll call this one a ball. So Fong E is basically the same thing as Fong, like I said. Diffuse is how much light it reflects. So if you take that down to zero, it reflects like no light. It's kind of hard to tell on, on black, but it just that's just like the base amount of light that it reflects. So, and you'll notice I'm not going completely black. Um, all color choices should not be 100% saturated because those digital colors don't happen in in real in the real world or if you do use them just use them very sparingly for little bits of emphasis and such so for my black eight ball I'm actually oh I didn't like the eight that's right I'm actually choosing like a dark charcoal color 
So, and it's going to, let's see, maybe if I do an underscore in front of it, it'll like it better. It doesn't like you know, starting with a number when you're naming things in Maya, but again, today's Maya is more forgiving than it used to be. It's just going to fix it for you instead of giving you a hard time or better yet, crashing about it. Um, the specular shading, uh, again, the language isn't really too important here, just as long as you get the general gist. Um, what matters is that I'm, the point is I'm, I'm adjusting the specular highlight here. And I'm going to, I don't want that to be too crazy, but Next up is Blin. Let's right click and assign new material. And we'll go to Blin. And Blin is a good choice of color for metals. So let's say we want to do a gold type of material here. Blin will make a good gold. Um, I'm going to do. Take it away from that corner. Avoid the corners. You want to be, you want to be um, a little less saturated than that, a little less high key than that, for the most part. So eccentricity. These are again. These are just controlling the specular highlight. Um, I'm going to make that a little bit more spread out and a little bit more prominent. So, there we go. And the specular color on metal should be the color of the metal. So, I'll make it a nice bright yellow and we'll get that gold color. Usually metal is at least a little bit reflective, if not a lot. Chrome should be somewhere up around 0.9 um, gold probably around 0.6 to 0.7 or so. I'm just guessing off the top of my head. Again, use your eyes. If your eyes are telling you that it needs to be higher or lower, then do that. And let's choose this one. And the last one we're going to check out is a ramp shader. And this is a gradient shader, essentially. Um, Let's do a right click, assign new material, and there's your ramp shader right there. And you can do a gradient of numerous different kinds, such as color, transparency, incandescence, specular shading, specular color, specular roll off, reflectivity, environment, and so on. I'm just going to do color. So let's start with this one and we'll do a little red color like that. And this is your this is your gradient swatch here. And if you're familiar with this in Photoshop or Adobe, any Adobe, then you can add stops just like Adobe and change the color on those stops. Let's add one more at the end, and we'll make that a lovely blue. The color input is going to determine how this gradient sits on the surface. So the color input, I'm going to go back to my Hypershade window. Windows, Rendering Editors, Hypershade. change this back to the shader ball and the color input will determine how that particular
gradient falls on the surface. So light angle is going to um, depend on how the light hits it. So, um, and I know I haven't talked about lighting, but if we go to the rendering tab and create a light, like a point light here, uh, what's going to happen is that shader will respond to the light. I think we have to turn lighting on to see that. And it's actually going to move according to how the light hits it. So, and that's different than what's happening with these because the color doesn't really move in any way on these other five. The, I mean, you can see the, um, the way the light hits it definitely affects the way the color is. But this actually, like the blue part of the gradient, follows the light. Now, if I change that to facing angle, then the blue part is going to be whatever's facing the camera. And if I change that to brightness, it's going to be whatever part is brightest will be the bluest. So I can put another light behind it and you can see that as the brightness increases, the gradient kind of shifts along with the brightness. And the last one is normalized brightness, which I don't really know what the difference between that and regular brightness is. You can look that up. So it gives you kind of a feel for how that ramp shader works. Um, that's not typically used to color objects. It's typically used on other things such as um, diffusion or specularity or stuff like that. As you already know, there's a few different ways to shade these in the workspace. You can get to those by pressing 4 for wireframe. 5 for smooth shaded, 6 for shaded display with texture maps, and you can use the lighting in your scene by clicking here, and that will apply the actual lights that you have in the scene instead of just the default lighting. This is also all under the shading menu. Uh, another one is flat shade all, which will reveal the polygons and take away the smoothing on it. Now, um, let me reiterate, uh, just be sure to understand this is your workspace preview. This is not having any effect on your render. So the render, the image, the way the image really looks has not changed. This is just how we're visualizing it as we work. <coughs> um, my personal preference is to turn on smooth shade with textures in the perspective view and usually on the um, top of the orthographic views I usually put it on wireframe uh, but that just depends on what I'm doing so it can change. Uh, so let's go into render settings. There's some render settings that we have to talk about. Uh, one is, first of all, make sure you're using Maya software, again, to reiterate. Um, you probably won't want anything else. And, um, again, to review the image size of everything that we're turning in should be HD 1080. Um, usually there's no exceptions, so always make sure to set those things. Just That's just as a baseline. Now, um, I'm going to talk more about this other stuff later when we get into animation because it has to do with multiple frames and renderable cameras, so we'll worry about that later. And if I go over to the Maya software tab, under quality I can choose a number of different render qualities. Um, if you start with uh, a preview quality, you can 
kind of play with your render for a while while you tweak it. And it'll render a little bit faster. So to give you an example here, you know, we can open the render window. gives us a fairly quick render and I can do some tweaks on my gold material turn up the reflectivity a little bit and this isn't going to change anything because I haven't turned on reflectivity in the renderer yet but you get the idea. This is pretty common when you're working on surfacing and lighting is to keep re-rendering and re-rendering. Um, another way to speed up that process is under the um, rendering menu set. You can go to render test resolution and you can do like a 50% test render or a 25% render. Remember to change this back to camera settings when you're done, but that can help also. So a 25% test render obviously is going to be one quarter the size. And that helps you when you're creating um, anything that requires you to render over and over again, which, which will happen periodically as you work. So I'm going to put this up to 3D motion blur production. I'm at my final render or getting close to it and I'm going to render it. It's going to take a little longer but um, it's going to do some more sweetening and um, smoothing on that render. So this still is not reflecting anything so it doesn't turn on the ray tracing reflecting. So I'm going to go to ray trace quality and just click turn on ray tracing and a lot of times that's that's all you really have to do. Um, but you can play with the rays if you want. So now it's going to take a little longer as the reflective materials are now reflecting what's around it. And that one's apparently a little reflective too. Um, 10 rays is a lot of times that's a lot of rays. Sometimes you can get away with less and that will speed up your render time. So you can see at 8 it still looks pretty good. at four it still looks pretty good so every one of those rays that you take out is less work that the computer has to do to generate this image 